Well, I think we can uh, we can get started here. I want to uh, begin by welcoming everyone to this uh, special online presentation of the Gloucester County Nature Club. Uh, and we're very pleased to have as our, our uh, speaker this evening, Mr. Joe Kiefer, who's manager of the Triple Oaks Nursery in, in Franklinville. I know, I'm sure many of you know Triple Oaks well. It's a well-established business. I've uh, gotten things there many times. They have a great selection of uh, native plants. Uh, in addition, uh, Joe is, uh, to, is, a bee, is a beekeeper. Uh, he's a lecturer on natural uh, nature and horticultural topics, a gardener, and an ornamental plant uh, professional. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Joe back. Uh, uh, he did a program for us exactly three years ago in May of uh, 2018. I'm very happy to have him back tonight. Joe is going to talk about this evening some of the native plants in our region and some of the plants that he had recently encountered on a hike in the Franklinville area. Uh, I think this is a, a wonderful time of the year for us to be thinking about and, and exploring our, our native, uh, native flora. And uh, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mr. Joe Kiefer and the native plants of South Jersey. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, I definitely spent a lot of time this this winter hiking um and one of my interests in in hiking is is native plants but uh th this past summer i did get lyme's disease so i was a little shell shocked to be going around um in the summertime and a lot of these places are really infested with ticks so i did a lot of hiking this winter and found some really great spots so you guys may be familiar with this book so the book was great um this hike this particular hike that i was on um it's not in the book but it could be or how you put i don't, I don't know if you want to let the out. but um this is a three county hike so this, this hike starts in gloucester county and you proceed through salem county and then you go to Cumberland County, so it's quite it's quite the hike. It's really awesome. Um, you see, we go past um, two different tributaries of the Marsh River that are, um, that converge into Willow Grove Lake. So here's one of my favorite um, one of my favorite species to find, um, and that is the Tamisiparis thioides, which is white cedar. White cedar is a majestic evergreen. That is found in swampy and wet areas. We have them out back at Triple Oaks. At Triple Oaks here behind Triple Oaks is the little Run, which is a tributary of the Morris River. Hey, could whoever's like talking, could they maybe mute or something like that? It's a little distracting. Anyway, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but that seems like background noise. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this is a, a picture right off of the... Um, right off of Scotland Run, uh, where you can see that the cedars really dominate the, uh, the, the skyline there, and then all the great other native plants below. Now, Atlantic white cedar is not as common as you'd think, but the places where it is, it's under a lot of pressure from deer. So you'll find that there are um, a lot of old specimens that are tall that have gone beyond, but the younger generation of cedars are really uh, pressured by the deer populations. Now, in this particular hike, and a lot of the different places, this is Nature, Conservanc Nature Conservancy. There are um, there, there are hunters, and there is hunting allowed, and that's probably a positive development because the deer pressure is extremely high. But you can see there are big, thick uh, stands of cedar. Now, in the past, these cedars were um, were cut down because the wood is amazing. It's straight. I'm sure there's a lot of sailboats in the past that have masks for that. There's furniture, there's uh, farm tools, all kinds of things would be made out of cedar. It has you know, antifungal and antibacterial properties that keep it from decomposing. Now, I believe that, that it is protected now and it is not legal to harvest. 
and they are just spectacular. Camisiparis is a gigantic genus of plants. Um, most of them are native to Asia. Um, there is Camisiparis. Um, um, there are there is a native Camisiparis to the west coast, and then also um, this would be the only Camisiparis that's native to the east coast. And if you see this picture, doesn't really um, show too well, but there's like a green blue lichen on the bark. So in this particular hike where I'm on, the, the, the camera doesn't quite catch it, but under certain light conditions, and I went back there so much this winter that there were a lot of different conditions I saw, but under certain conditions, the trees look like they're blue. And that's a very interesting development. And you can see the standing water um, in very swampy locations. This is Scotland Run. Um, there's like a, you can't see it, but there's like a, a, a rope swing on one of those branches there where people used to swim. And right to the left off of the frame is um, an old concrete bridge. It looks around 1910 or 1900 or 1920. So back here, there's roads everywhere. And there used to be, I don't know what activity really, probably logging cedars, but um, there are some roads back there and there was a bridge. So there, there may very well have been developed area as far as development in that time frame was. But it'd be just beautiful, beautiful uh, peaceful location. And here's the upland through there. There's a lot of pine, uh, Virginia pine, as well as the short leaf, short needle pine. A lot of oaks, different oak uh, throughout. There's smaller oaks that are scrubby, and then there's bigger ones. Um, you don't find back in this spot, spot, you don't find giant white oaks or, or big willow oaks or anything like that because uh, I guess the soils are on the poor side. This is very Pine Barrens-like um, area. And um, American holly, Ilex opaca, is found like pretty much everywhere through here, except when you go to the very high and very dry areas, you won't see as much of it. But this particular plant pictured is quite high and dry. Like there's really no water around there, but you'll find them, you know, in, in thicker stands where it's uh, more swampy. This is a little bit off topic because this is not on the same hike, but this is a, um, a notable tree. Um, this is around the Rutgers Experimental Farm in, uh, I guess it would be Bridgeton, but it's right near Centerton. And this is Magnolia acuminata, which is the cucumber magnolia. And most people think of magnolias as a little tulipy, uh, spring-blooming, like Easter plant, and most of those will be native to China. But the Magnolia cuminata is a giant shade tree that is native to South Jersey. And this particular plant, I don't know if that is naturally occurring or if it was planted. I initially thought that it was planted, but I posted this on um, like a, I don't know, plant snob or tree snob uh, Facebook group. And the consensus was it's probably naturally occurring, but I don't know for sure. But that is quite a specimen. If you ever see it, I drove past it two days ago and it's all leafed out and gorgeous, but um, Magnolia cuminata is a wonderful native uh, tree. If you can find one, that'd be really impressive. But here's back to the hike and um, the red maples are another tree that you'll see everywhere, Acer rubrum. Um, Acer rubrum is just a great tree, a great shade tree for South Jersey. Now in a residential or you know, municipal settings, it can be problematic because it has high roots that are bad for grass and will definitely tear up sidewalks and pavement and things like that. So if you want a lawn tree, it would be fine, but it would eventually do bad to your lawn. Uh, red maple is a vital tree for honeybees and other native pollinators because it has you know, flowers in early spring when these insects are ramping up and when they need, they have a need for um, different, the, the pollen and, um, that they produce. 
Another bo bonus for us, and that we've had the class several several years in a row at Triple Oaks, is maple syrup. My dad is a maple syrup syrup fanatic, and he uh, taps the red maples and takes the sap and boils it down um, and makes the most amazing maple syrup that you'll ever have uh, from red maple. The thing about maple, uh, maple syrup is you think of Vermont or New York, like it's all sugar maples, but um, in all those places, red maple is occurring and the, the syrup makers, they tap all the red maples because they, they, don't, they don't say, oh, that's a red maple. The only difference in the sap or, or, or the syrup, I mean, the sap is that um, the sugar maple is a little bit more sugar in it. So if you have to boil like something like 32 gallons of sugar maple sap, you'd have to uh, boil 40 gallons of red maple. So it's just a little bit less sugar than a sugar maple, but that's pretty good. And the syrup is tremendous and it's better than anything you could buy in a store from Vermont or Quebec or Ontario or New York, simply because it's super fresh and super awesome. If you've ever heard of the uh, maple syrup cartels, that's a serious business and they store the maple syrup for quite a long time to affect price. So when it's fresher, I believe it has a better taste. That's just my opinion. And if you make something yourself from the native plants on your own land and on your friend's ground or maybe find a public place where they'll let you. My dad has a church or two where he taps a tree um, or two or sugar maples at the, our local church. We planted the sugar maples so the priest doesn't mind. So that is a great aspect of, uh, I forgot to mention that with the foraging question earlier on. So here's a, just a picture of the, the beautiful pine lands and the pines there. Um, and the undergrowth is a lot of uh, low bush blueberry, and I'm sure a lot of other things that I'm just not familiar with. So when I do a talk like this, I am not an academic, and I don't have a vast knowledge of every species on an academic level. My background is more commercial and like retail, like nursery garden center. But we do propagate um, local indigenous native plants to sell. So I'm very interested in all the plants that you'll find back here. And this is one of my very favorites. This is Ilex glabra, and that is Inkberry holly. You can see where it gets the name because it has black berries that look like ink. Now, one interesting thing that I found is there is great variation in the Ilex glabra that you'll find there are some that are in the four to six foot range and they'll have like a round um, leaf that's lighter green. There's some that have a fatter leaf that are squat, more squat. And there's some that seem to get in the 14 to 16 foot range that are more open. Now, I'm not sure if some of these things may be environmental or just the conditions present in one spot, but it is interesting to see the variation in the different um, Ilex Glaber. Here in Franklinville, there's one spot around the head of Franklinville Lake where there's very, very low ones. Now, I just, I'm, I'm, I think that it may be due to the power lines and the, if they, I don't know if they spray or if they cut or what they do, but it may have something to do with that. Um, but it's, it's really interesting because it does have a different leaf type. Another broadleaf evergreen that is wonderful to find and just awesome to see is sheep's laurel or it's called also called lamb's kill because it is i think toxic to lambs and uh, livestock so you don't want to feed it to livestock but this is calmia angustifolia and that is calmia is the same genus as mountain laurel so this is the sheep's laurel and you see this it looks very uh, elegant and dainty and when, the, when it's below freezing, the leaves take on that wilted appearance that sometimes rhododendrons or other evergreens will take that spinach wilted look. Um, but this is Kamiangasa folly. It grows in large um, stands like this that you see. And it's just wonderful and elegant and dainty. It has a beautiful little flower. Now, I never am really hiking in these areas due to ticks, 
during the flowering time. So I don't even have a single picture. And there's the real mountain laurel. That's the big mountain laurel. And those are quite large. There's um, a lot of variation in mountain laurels too. Some of them are pink. If you drive on Route 55 in Franklinville between exit 43 and then exit whatever the Malaga Elmer exit is for Route 40, um, some of those mountain laurels there are um, shading towards pink, the pink color. Now most normally it's white. Now in the nursery trade, there's a lot of cultivars that are red and red and white and pink and white and red and candy cane and all different, um, all different colors. But the general thing you'll find in the wild is white and they can get quite large, but in general, as a, as a ornamental plant, if you're growing this in your garden, it's probably a good idea to prune it, nib it back every couple of years so it doesn't get lanky. Um, but if you find some of them in the wild that have like very lanky and open, they, they have beautiful craggy like brown bark that can be twisted and, and beautiful. And this is one of my very favorite plants on this hike. This is um, some sort of hybrid of Mirica serifera. And Mirica serifera is called Southern Wax Myrtle. And most people think of it as a Southern plant and that it won't grow in New Jersey or it's not appropriate, but this, the Mirica serifera is native to New Jersey and it's native to right here in Franklinville. And there are so many different types. I went to, I donated a plant of uh, this, this variety because I took some cuttings um, uh, about 10 years ago. And I donated one plant of this to the um, National Botanical Garden in DC. And I asked if the, they had any information and they, they knew of information to be had, but they didn't um, have it. But there's so much variation in wax myrtle that I, I'm really interested to get with some people who are academic to find out because there's certain types that have like, that look like olive leaf, the olive tree leaf and they get about 10 to 12 feet tall. And then there's this variety here. It looks just like a deciduous azalea, but in January. And um, these are shorter. They're like five to seven feet tall. They're, they're pretty short. They're not big. And then there's wax myrtles that get about 40 feet tall and they have a completely different leaf. So there's just so much out there. You know, the debate, there's always lumpers and splitters. Some people want to lump everything together into one species, and some people want to split them all apart. I am interested in the splitting of this genus and see what these are and what the, the difference is, if any. So they're very, very interesting. But that is Mirica serifera. Now, I know it has a new name. I believe it's Morella, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm still using Mirica myself. I'm not sure if that's a big deal with anyone. But uh, this is another interesting plant. This is new to me. This was in January. So it was pretty evergreen. If not evergreen, it was very tardily deciduous. But those leaves were on. And uh, it was a mild winter up to that point. So I'm not sure. But this is Camadaphne. And Camadaphne, I am the, the, the Latin name, the species name is escaping me right now. But it's Camadaphne which is a wild looking plant. And there's just like a little stand of it right at the lake back there. So that is really an interesting new to me plant. I want to take cuttings and get some of those and see if they'll grow under normal garden conditions. Because a lot of these plants are very specified and have specific con conditions. Um, so you're not, not sure that they'll all thrive. That's no, no, no reason why they wouldn't really. Here's a blueberry bush. And this is kind of a dated picture. So, I mean, all these pictures are in the winter time pretty much. So I'm not showing you the leaf or the fruit or the flowers, but um, this is a high bush blueberry. This will be the same plant that we buy blueberries in the store. If you go on vacation and you go to Colorado or Texas or, or wherever you go, you can probably go to a grocery store at the right time and find blueberries from Hamilton or somewhere in South Jersey because they just, we're just, we used to grow a lot of blueberries here. And interestingly enough, the, I think her name was Elizabeth White of Whitesbog. She offered the local 
pineys 50 bucks for a plant if they could find in the wild a plant a blueberry that had you know larger and sweeter fruits so she got i think 100 or 150 plants that way and the breeding program there began which is all the major uh, cultivars that are still used today and we sell in our nursery here we still sell the same cultivars that were developed from that program and that was a pretty awesome thing for equal rights and um, feminism because at that time women weren't supposed to be doing that kind of stuff and she uh, I think her husband had a stroke or he was physically not able to do stuff and she kind of took over and uh, you know just took the social um, restrictions and push them aside which is pretty awesome and this is back in the back of Willow Grove Lake and this is can't really tell much but that is an Amelanchier canadensis so Amelanchier it's possible that that's Amelanchier lavis which is more tree like I have very difficult time telling the difference between the two I know out back we have on the creek here we have a big tree and it's almost a single trunk and i think i believe that's lavis but up the street on one of our fields there's uh there's a canadensis which i'm almost positive is canadensis and it's a clump but the thing is it's about 20 it's about 20 feet tall so it's just so big it's like kind of like you think oh one's tree like and one's bush like well the bush one gets so big that it's almost um it's almost it was difficult for me to tell them apart. I'm sure experts can tell them apart, but this is Amelanchier right in its habitat. You'll find it somewhere near moisture. If not, um, although it's not a total wetlands plant, you'll find it on the edge of woods and places around that are non-wetlands. And this is not on the hike. This is actually at Triple Oaks here. And that is mistletoe. So the place next door to Triple Oaks, there's a, um, a mechanics, well, the mechanic is across the street, but they have a car lot um, on our side, and they did a lot of clearing of different trees um, just to make it a more attractive lot, I think, to develop or build something. But when they cleared out, we saw there's a gum tree there with mistletoe in it. So I never saw mistletoe before um, on our property. It's it's all around here. It's around Malaga Lake a lot. If you cross the little ease run on Williamstown Road. Um, if you look carefully without crashing, or maybe if you want to be a passenger, you can look in that sort of where that river is and you'll see the um, you'll see mistletoe up in the trees. And that's pretty awesome. And this is an amazing mushroom that I found back there in the um, in the hike. You can see it's a, it's a polypore mushroom, like a shelf mushroom, and it has that velvety bottom underneath, and then it has another layer on top, and then there's all the lichen growing in there. So I actually posted this picture on the mushroom identification page, and it took quite a while to identify it because there's just so many things out there and there's so few experts, but this picture got like 2,000 likes. It was my most popular Facebook moment ever. and. Uh, it is a beautiful picture and it's a pretty awesome specimen. But that's the kind of diversity you'll see back there. And this is a uh, Gandoderma. And the Gandoderma is also known as Rishi or Reishi. And that is a very medicinal mushroom. Uh, it's used in, you know, eight, most of the Asian culture for teas and powders and for a lot of different uses, but it's beautiful. And it's out there here in South Jersey. These are turkey tail mushrooms. They have a medicinal use. I'm not sure what you do with those, but they're interesting and they're beautiful. Um, and they're very common. You'll find them on all kinds of different wood that's decomposing. Here's a shot, the typical shot of this, this particular hike, just pine needle trail with white beach sand underneath, just pines everywhere and then a lot of undergrowth that sort of varies and changes. But this particular area is about, I don't know, three or four acres of what's called reindeer moss. And that reindeer moss is quite interesting. It's crunchy if you walk on it, it can absorb and hold a lot of water as well. 
Um, I've researched it a little bit. It's, it is actually edible, but it is so acid that you literally have to boil it several times um, and change the water before you can get the acidity out of it. But once you do that, it's probably, I don't know, I'm thinking it's not that good, but <laughs> uh, who knows, it may be great. But I'm thinking it's probably too much work and not delicious, but it's a really interesting plant. And you can see more close up and um, you'll find this commonly in different areas in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. We have it right up the street here in one of our fields. And far right there with it is you'll find uh, tea berry or wintergreen. And this is uh, Galteria procumbens. And you can see it's, it's evergreen ground cover. And it has bright red edible fruit. They're delicious. You can eat them. I'm sure they must be really, really good for you. Um, what we do occasionally is we'll pick some and make simple syrup from them. And the simple syrup can be used for anything um, mocktails, cocktails, ice cream, uh, dessert, like whatever you would use something sweet for that's flavored. And it has wonderful, uh, minty, like winter greeny kind of flavor. If you ever had tea berry gum, it is the, it's the, definitely the exact same flavor that tea berry gum has. I used to like that in high school. I was disappointed to find out that tea berry gum never really used tea berries to flavor it. It was always just like chemicals, but Go figure. And there's what it looks like in um, in mass. It has good fall color. This is obviously the winter. There's still berries present, but there's the purple fall color. And there are large patches of it. This isn't the kind of thing that you're gonna plant in your yard and just have it take over like Pachysandra. It's very, it's kind of sparse. And where it's really happy is a place like this in this slide where it's really taking over, but it doesn't really take over, so. That's something, it's kind of a subtle uh, evergreen ground cover. And you see some more of it there. And this is sphagnum moss. This is, uh, I believe, at Franklin Lake. This is not from the same hike, or it may be from the same hike, I can't remember. But the sphagnum moss is, um, you know, as it decomposes, you, it, it has, you can make layers of, Peat moss, which is what peat, where peat comes from, is this kind of moss. Um, and you'll find this around in South Jersey. It's out back here in our swamp. And it's also in around Franklin Lake. And it's back there in Willow Grove Lake as well. So that is sphagnum moss. You'll find that with sundews. In the back of Franklin Lake, you can find sundews and pitcher plants. And, you know, the different carnivorous plants of South Jersey will grow right in conjunction with the sphagnum moss. And here's a new one for me. This is uh, also a carnivorous plant. This is called bladderwort. And this is a carnivorous plant that lives in the water. So this little thing floats around right there. It's floating in the lake. And that's my friend Nate Kleinman from the Experimental Farm Network. And he keyed me into that. I, didn't need, I was not really aware of this plant. But uh, it's really neat. It has those little bubbles on the on the on the. Uh, little branches and they really just they float there and they just sort of harvest different aquatic life so it's literally a carnivorous plant um, that lives in the water which is pretty cool there's a big one just floating there and this is the back so this is when you take this hike and you get to the very back you have to pretty much put your toe in the water to to um, to cross the Cumberland County because so the water is the uh, border so if you want to make it a real Three county hike, you gotta step in the water. And this is uh this is not on the hike, this is in my backyard. This is uh on the other side of Triple Oaks. It's pretty awesome. Um freshwater mollusk. Um I did have this identified. I, I don't have the name because I lost my slide list, but this is a native freshwater mollusk. It's like a mussel. Now in our little area back there, there's just piles and piles and piles of shells of another one that looks a little bit like a clam. And I was had that identified um, as the invasive Chinese one, but there's also the native ones, which is really cool. I believe this is a video, let me see, here we go. You can see in this video, you can see that the, uh, 
that the muscle is extended. It's out of the shell there onto the leaf and they're just sucking and cleaning the bottom of the river. And this comes right from Delcy Drive, so that oily sheen probably is petroleum, which is unfortunate, but despite that, the, the quality of the water and the diversity of life in the water seems to be awesome. Um, some of you may remember the Nixon administration did some water and air things, despite some of their other malfeasance, they did some good things for the environment. And in that time frame of whatever, the last 50 years, there's been a lot of uh, results. And hopefully that, you know, the, some of the changes that have happened in the last um, years will not affect that. But well, here's the, the Chinese ones. And uh, I'm, I think it's, uh, not sure if it's otters or if it's raccoons that collect them and eat them. But whatever it is, they seem to accumulate them and then bring them here because there's literally at this particular spot, there's hundreds of shells. I think it's otters because I think otters might have like a, like a pouch or something like a way to carry them, but I'm not sure about that. But there are so many of them. I thought, wow, look at all the mollusks. And then I put it on the mollusk identification page on Facebook. And yeah, it's definitely a, an invasive. But there's something that's eating them and really enjoying them. And we have seen the otters. Uh, I didn't see the otters as much this year. I saw otters once this year. But two years ago, I saw the otters here constantly. And I saw baby otters. So I don't know if they had the, had the baby otters here or, or not. But I know at Willow Grove Lake at the back where this hike that I've been telling you about goes, there's a lot of otters there because there's certain areas there where you go and there's a lot of otter scat. And you can tell otter poo because it's full of scales because otters just eat fish. I mean, I guess they, maybe they eat these things too, but I don't know. Oh, and speaking of which, that is otter poo. And you can see the scales right in there. And this is back in Willow Grove Lake. And you can see this spot is really far away for many of the hunters and the hunters piles, but the, the corn cob all the way on the right, you can see from the, the hunters just bait the, um, the deer, I guess. It's kind of like keeping livestock without a fence, like they feed them so much. Uh, I guess that's the way they do it, but uh, that seems a little weird. But this corn seems to end up everywhere. The squirrels take it all over the place. And this is a spot, um, I call this like a bluff. There's like like a real high ground there that you can see. And it's really high. It's, it's about, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet above the water. And one thing about this spot is there always seems to be golden eagles there. So I'm not a bird expert. No. I do believe there are uh, nesting or native or existing golden eagles in this spot because you just always see them uh, back there. And here are the olives from the Kynanthus virginicus. So these are uh, old man's beard, which is also called fringe tree. So these are the fruits harvested right off of the plant. And these were cultivated, and these are just plants in the nursery. And I was like, that's a shame. I should try to grow them. But to grow these, they have a, a double dormancy that takes actually an extra uh, time. So they're really just difficult to propagate from seed. And people are like, why do they cost so much? Well, it's like, well, they're very difficult to propagate. They don't root from cuttings, and they're not easy to graft. So they're very not propagatable plant. But if you do it, you can do it. It's just you have to really do it. Now, these trees, um, this plant is native to the Marsh River. So if you go uh, just south of Willow Grove Lake, and maybe even around here, that I just haven't seen them. I haven't seen every inch of the wilds here. But I know that if you go on – South of Willow Grove Lake in a canoe or kayak, you'll definitely find Old Man's Beard. And in one spot around Almond Road in Vineland, it's there's just a tunnel where the, um, the, 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 the canopy of trees just makes a tunnel that you kayak through. And the, the Old Man's Beard is on both sides of the river. When I went through there once when it was blooming. And literally, you're just stuck in this tunnel of perfume because the flowers are so amazingly fragrant and it's just the most wonderful fragrance 
So I highly recommend when they're blooming, which is kind of like right now, like anybody who has a kayak, I would say go around the Almond Road and find those trees in that tunnel. You won't regret it. But here they are in brine. And brine is just salt water. I ended up uh, probably using a little too much salt. They tended, they were like a little tiny bit salty, not really salty, but just a little bit salty, but it's okay. Um, and then here they are in jars with a little bit of thyme and olive oil. And I think they were good. I, th I thought they were delicious. So if anybody's interested in foraging and a plant that you can forage, it's probably best to find a cultivated tree somewhere because going out in the wild would be very, very difficult to find enough. And here's some uh, chanterelle mushrooms. This is basically probably the most delicious mushroom that there is. And these are all over South Jersey. They grow where there are oak trees. If you see oak trees and moss, there's a very good chance that there'll be chanterelles around. Now, chanterelles will only be around when it rains a lot. So if it doesn't rain a lot and you go there and you don't see them, it doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that, that you're not seeing them. But as one of the books I read about mushrooms is sometimes um, sometimes you find mushrooms and then, but sometimes the mushrooms find you. That's how, that's what happened with me and chanterelles. I mean, I found these mushrooms and uh, it was just like, you know, they were like, kind of like right here forever. And finally I just, uh, I don't know why I was even in that spot and I found them. And then once I found them, they seem to appear in other places, but really you just have to be in tune with, the rain a lot of it is how much precipitation we have in the winter because you have precipitation in the winter it builds the my um helps the mycelium build and have like a great crop in the um in the season and uh chanterelles are very nice to collect that again ticks would be the only downside or chiggers and then um there are several kinds of chanterelles there's really no poisonous look-alikes so if you think, oh, I'll, I'll, I would die if I go collect mushrooms. Well, there's really nothing you could really, if, you, if you're looking for chanterelles, there's one mushroom here that looks like a chanterelle, and it doesn't really look like a chanterelle. And if you look at it, it has different gills, and that's how you identify mushrooms. And, well, one of the ways, there's a lot of ways, but one of the ways is gills, and these are like false gills on a chanterelle, so they're not – separate like like um, a real gill is like a piece of a sheet of paper these ones are just like um not like a sheet of paper they're just sort of like a ridge so it's really almost impossible to um mistake a chanterelle for a bad mushroom and those false chanterelles i mean they will make you probably a little bit sick to your stomach like you wouldn't like die now there are mushrooms in new jersey that will literally kill you so if you're gonna forage mushrooms, be sure to be an expert or consult with an expert or get a mentor. And my advice, and this is what I do, is I do not forage anything that could be mistaken for something poisonous. So there's three poison mushrooms and they're all like white and they look like uh, meadow mushrooms or agaricus, which are essentially like portobellos or, you know, this like little button mushrooms. Like those are here a little bit but they have several deadly look-alike mushrooms that you just, I don't even, I would never even mess with it. The only thing white that I will even uh, harvest and eat is um, puffballs. And the puffballs are pretty easy to identify. Um, and they're like, you can tell that they're puffballs by the way that they grow. But here's some chanterelles. The orange ones um, are called cinnabars and they're usually smaller. And I don't know if they taste any different, but the big yellow ones are just a regular flat out chanterelle. They're French. I mean, they're from, they're well known in France. They're extremely well known in all of Europe. Um, Poland, Polish people go bananas over this, Russians, Ukrainians. Um, everybody in Eastern Europe um, loves mushrooms. And that's a beautiful picture of them all cleaned up once they're cleaned and ready to eat. You can cook them, saute them, put them on pizza. You can pickle them. You can make stock. You can do all kinds of stuff. So there's so many things 
that you can do. And this was about the most chanterelles that we ever found. <laughs> this was a lot. And that was like a bountiful harvest. You see a little paintbrush there. You clean the you can clean the sand off with paintbrush and the paintbrushes. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So anyway, there's a little frog. This is uh, one of those gray frogs. And this is just to end the talk. So I'm going to be, let me see if I can figure this out. I'll shut the thing off and see if anybody has any questions. How do I do this? There we go. Is everybody still there? Hello. Yep, we're here. We can, your presentation is still on. You need to like, stop sharing. Um, okay, let me stop. It'd be funny if I talk for 30 minutes with nobody there. Okay, can you see me now? Yep, that's good. Okay, good. I hope everyone liked it. Does anyone have any questions? Anybody wait? <laughs> I want to say thanks for a wonderful program. Yeah, you're welcome. And, uh, you know, I like to do these programs in person, too. So it's a... Uh, the Zoom call is great. I hopefully, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Um, but it's a little easier in person. But if you ever, I know the restrictions are lifting. Um, if your group ever wants to meet here, we offer like uh, free use of our facilities and free presentation and garden walk and talk and tour or whatever. So if you do ever want to meet here, that's wonderful. It's great. You said you raise bees, right? Yes, I have uh, a lot of bees. I have bees here. How are you controlling your uh, hive beetles? Uh, my hives are on full sun, and I don't, I don't really have a lot of hive beetle problem. I don't know if it's just keeping them in the sun or if it's the bees. Um, one thing that I do that I think helps a lot is I, I, I have the bees very dense. I don't add a lot of boxes. I have a couple of uh, hives that are comfort hives, like Sam Comfort. Um, they're like little tiny hives that are kind of like a Wari hive, but they're comfort hives. They're I, I just started a cat's trats hive, uh, the bees right. in California, five pound box of bees. Uh huh. And the hive beetles, they must have smelled the hive because within a week they came out of nowhere because it was clean coming in. Now they're full of hive beetles. I've been mm. killing them one by one. I've tried the uh, hive beetle towels, tried the uh, vegetable oil, but uh, I've been going in there killing them one by one. But uh, they sniff out a hive and they just come. Well, is the hive in sun? Yes. It might be something to do with the, the variety of bee because basically also, I mean, you may have exceptional pressure of hive beetles for some reason that I don't have. Um, I'm not sure, but I know one thing. All around us here, people have Japanese beetle issues, and we don't. So I don't know if it's the chickens or if it's – I don't know what I don't know what it is, but, like, we don't have other kinds of beetles here. It may be that. I don't really know. But I've found with when we we're talking to people, um, the different ways to try to get them with these traps and things, it's like basically the problem is I think that there's too many hive beetles and that, that, that the traps don't help that address that. But um, it may be the bees, like maybe some bees are really better at it or some bees are worse at it. Or again, you may be in a place with exceptional pressure for some reason. Yeah, I killed off my bees about five years ago and I quit because it just killed them off. I mean, I can control the variable, var the mites and that, but I just couldn't get the hive beetles. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've never had a real problem with them. I don't know. I should just like knock on wood and consider myself lucky. But um, I haven't had problems. But I mean, I what I've what I've figured out over the five or six years I've been beekeeping is that the more uh, dense that the bees are, the better they do. And that's, uh, you just have to always, uh, I mean, I 
always at first I always wanted to put more boxes and I wanted them to build and like say, Hey, do this, do that, do this, do that. And that was not the way to do it. Like the, whenever I had like hives, that was like, never, I didn't get to it. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. It's like those hives that were like, didn't get the box added and didn't get this, didn't get that were really packed in there. Those are the ones that seem to always survive. And I always have like a bunch of nukes. So I have a bunch of nukes going and you like, just I get them at Harvey's and they make, um, I put the silver paper. What's it called? I forget the name of the stuff, but put that and they have these wax like um, boards on top. So you can sit them right next to each other and you can stack them on top of each other. And then like even like throw, you know, throw some whatever around them and uh, they, they share the heat and having the nukes are really packed tight. Um, it's like you always have bees in the spring because the nukes seem to, I mean, they seem to, I mean, you usually get 50 or 60% of the nukes so do fine. I'm trying the smaller comb now. That's gonna. That's a new thing. The smaller yeah, comb. I do foundationless too, so I don't use any foundation. I don't know if that helps, but I'm not like your picture of success. I've had like heavy losses the first years. Now this year I did pretty good. Last year I did great, and the year before I did okay. But the th three years before that, I, I was a beginner too, and I think that was a big deal. But um. Um, it's just really, I think that there's so many variables that are out of your control, um, that it's like the other thing too is, and I was talking to Sam Comfort, Sam Comfort's a, an unusual beekeeper guy, but he sells Queens for the most part. And, um, what he was saying was he, he sends his Queens to, I think university of Maryland or somewhere and his Queens have like good everything. And he does queens a different way. He doesn't graft them anymore. He just takes them out of a little, he makes, he has these little tiny hives and he has these, like puts a divider between a teeny weeny little hive and his two hives and he takes the queen out and they make a new queen on their own. And what he was saying was the, the research coming back is that doing queens that way is extremely better than grafted queens. So like when you have a, a natural hive, the, 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 the best queen is generally going to come out and kill the other ones. So when you graft, it's like you're just getting all those ones that nature is supposed to execute, and they didn't. So, like, a lot of package bees and commercial bees are just, like, not good because, you know, they weren't meant to live. And I think Tom Seeley even said in his talks, I think he said that 40% 40 of bees that swarm and go into a tree, 40% of them live. That means that under natural conditions, 60% of them die. So I wouldn't be too discouraged. Well, I, I found out Winona is a very hard place to raise bees because the honey flow is only from like uh, end of March to the middle of June and that's it. Hmm. Whereas a lot of other places have a flow in the fall. But I have no, I've been here a long time and no flow in the fall. Wow. You have to plant some, uh, BB trees and uh, golden rain trees. Well, it's it's within range of the Winona trails, but there's no flowers that they seem to huh. bring enough flow in. I seem, to get, I seem to get a a on plethora. A of stuff to do. I seem to get a flow on plethora. And then there's this stuff that's uh, it's some kind of Lespedeza, or it may be invasive. I'm not sure if it's a native Lespedeza or, or an invasive one, but they seem to love that and go to that. Um, and I get different honey from the bees that go to that. It's real golden. It's really nice. And uh, I guess we have a lot of uh, a lot of asters here, a lot of asters, and uh, a lot of goldenrod. And you can see that in the honey and smell it. Like you can smell and see the goldenrod and asters. Some people don't like it, but I like it. I like I like all. I like buckwheat honey. I like it all. Well, I don't want to hog the talk anymore. We can have a uh, a bee talk, right, Rich? Someday. <laughs> we could do a bee demo here if anyone's interested. So, are there any other questions about the plants or anything like that? Everybody's shy or asleep. Not asleep. So I'm here in the nursery, if anyone can see that. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Oh, yes. 
loaded up with plants. <laughs> And there's Delcy Drive out there. I'm used to my phone. I can flip it around. This is a laptop. <clears throat> All right. Well, I do have a slideshow um, slide list for this talk. And uh, I just couldn't seem to locate it. Um, just been having some issues with this computer and the iCloud, like scooping my stuff up and hiding it from me. So if, uh, if I'm able to find that, if people are interested, I can definitely get you the um, slide list with the, the plant names in Latin and, uh, and uh, all the information. And that is a great hike. I took some ladies there from the, the Herb Society of America uh, before it was still, before it was warm out. So if your group, I know with that book, there's a lot of great hikes in it. But if your group would ever be interested in the winter and taking that hike, it's approximately three-mile round trip. And it's a very nice hike. Um, you can do it as much as five miles. Loops. You can do the whole thing um, and do like five miles and you can, you definitely can see like the still run, which our Creek that's right. Where is it? Our Creek is like right back that way. And that's the little ease run. It basically goes that way. And then it crosses route 40 and it meets still run right at that place. So, um, but that's still run on the one side and then Scotland run, you can do five miles. You can, uh, definitely see both of those rivers come in together to Willow Grove Lake. It's just an amazing hike. Okay. We'll sign you up, Joe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He'll be a leader. Yeah, I took the Herb Society ladies there. Um, they couldn't really do two, three miles, so they were scared. But uh, we did. Uh, we did the quick little walk to the bluffs, and that was really nice. I mean, even, even that, I mean, you see all the native plants. It's amazing. That whole place used to be owned by DuPont, and it was a DuPont. I guess they were going to build, like, a mega um, chemical facility there, like, right on all those wetlands. Mm. But for some uh, some reason, they didn't, and they donated to Nature Conservancy, which is wow. nice. Yeah, that's so. something we talked about. I'd look into for next, uh, next fall or next winter. I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Joe. That's great. Well, we have a question here. Can they get a map of the hike you described? Um, I'll just go on Google and look at uh, Route 55 and 40. And uh, that's pretty much where it is. I shouldn't tell people because it's my secret spot, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like 55 and 40. And uh, you see there's a little, little paved road that goes into the back. And that we call that the DuPont access road. And uh, that drives in the back. Usually the hunters have it chained off. And that is actually illegal. So I was talking to the police. There's a police officer back there one day when we went. He was off duty, but he was, uh, you know, sporting his badge and, and all that. But um, I talked to him about it. And he said, yeah, it's illegal. They can't lock it off because EMS has to access it, have access to uh a nature conservancy place, but they chain it up so you can't drive back there. So it's it's fine. You just park out by the road, but uh, it's really interesting. But you can see on Google Maps, like pretty much, if you just go from that spot and you go to the lake, there's just all trails in between. Like I guess from the satellite, you may or may not be able to see the actual trails. I think you can see them for the most part. Okay. We had a question here. What do you think are the most beneficial plants for our wildlife? The most beneficial plants for our wildlife. Well, it kind of depends on your angle because um, there's all different plants that are going to do different things for different wildlife. Like if you like hummingbirds, then I would say plant a red buckeye 
because the red buckeye tree is a plant that grows from practically Florida to, to, to New York in the Appalachian Mountains. And the hummingbirds literally uh, go north with the, um, with the bloom. So by the time yours blooms, if you have that tree, the hummingbirds will exhaust it of the nectar and make a nest nearby. Um, so that's something. You know, and then if you want to um, feed the birds in the winter, maybe like a winterberry holly is a great thing, or aronia, like there's aronia, um, the red variety, chokeberry, and there's also the black chokeberry. Uh, both of those are going to be fantastic for feeding birds. If you want a spice bush swallowtail, then you'd plant a spice bush, which is Lindera benzoin. Um, it kind of really just depends. There's pipevine swallowtails that would go on a pipevine plant, the Dutchman's pipe. And then, uh, you know, things like um, a tulip tree, a tulip tree, like people call it poplar by mistake, but it's actually in the magnolia family. So a tulip tree is going to be excellent for uh, pollinators that want nectar. It's full of nectar. Um, so it's a great nectar plant. There's also a swallowtail that um, that it's a host plant for. And then uh, serviceberry is another great one for wildlife. American holly is tremendous. I mean, it's a food source for birds, but it's also uh, a shelter source for birds. Um, American holly is going to be very good shelter for maybe different wildlife as well. And, you know, red cedar is another one that's fantastic. People rarely rarely plant red cedars there's so many of them everywhere it seems like a weed tree or something that's not worthy um, but we just planted several in a garden in ocean city and i mean there's a big beautiful specimens and you know the, the right people appreciate it and uh that's a good one as well and then there's all kinds of perennials milkweed for monarchs all there's all kinds of uh perennials for nectar for uh, for uh, butterflies and birds and or rather bees rather not birds <laughs> but uh, but there you know it's kind of depends on your outlook there's all kinds of great stuff and right now our nursery is full of a lot of it so I'm just kind of like looking down at stuff and getting ideas of what to say because you know there's like so many different things but they're all like right here it's great so Oh, and grapes too. Nobody grows wild grapes. I'm gonna probably propagate some, but wild grapes are really cool too. They're all over the place in our swamp back here. And fringe tree is another one. The old man's beard. Other than making your own olives, which is really cool, um, that seems to me to be one of the awesome trees. Pollinators love it. You know, the birds are gonna love it for the fruits and. Uh, it's just so fragrant and nice. So that's a good one. And you should plant stuff that you enjoy too. So like ornamental plants that you like. Um, that's important as well. See, here's the herb garden. You can see that we're gonna have, uh, this year we're gonna have our uh, annual herb festival. If anybody's interested, it's May 29th and May 30th. We're going to have Susan Belsinger, who's a awesome, awesome herbal cook and uh, presenter, and also Susan Hess, who is another awesome. We've got like two headliners this year, which is amazing. We're, they're both going to be both days. And then I'll do some presentation probably on either native plants, or I'll probably do a pr presentation on bees or pollinators and pollinator plants. And then uh, my mom does presentations and stuff. And the South Jersey unit of the Herb Society of America, they do some demonstrations and have their table up. And that's a great group. If people want another group to join the, the South Jersey chapter of the Herb Society, it's a really fantastic group. But that's exciting, you know, after pandemic and all that, to have uh, these events now. So we'll be happy to have our, you know, herb garden buzzing again. And, um, I think the CDC, I just saw before this talk, the CDC said uh, 
vaccinated people don't even have to wear a mask. So that's going to be a real positive. And hopefully everyone's able to get vaccinated if they want it. So you guys could have a meeting soon if you're vaccinated. But we're looking at that next year as a possibility. Yeah. And the other thing is the Orchid Society is going to have a meeting here outdoors um, this weekend, actually. If you ever wanted to use our facility again, you're more than welcome. And we have outdoor space as well that can be utilized. It's getting chilly. <laughs> Hey, any other questions from anyone? Well, <clears throat> Joe, I want to thank you so much for a really wonderful program this evening. I think everybody found that that hike something they want to take themselves. You, 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 it's like you took us right into those, down those paths and to see those wonderful plants. So thank you for that and for all of your knowledge. Uh, we appreciate it so much. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, additional things in the future. So thank you. And to everyone who came out tonight, um, Nature Club is coming back. Uh, we, we have plans for, uh, for coming up next year, wonderful programs and activities. And uh, you'll be hearing from us in our newsletter and through other means of communication. But we have lots of things planned, so stay tuned. And thank you Excellent. all tonight very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks, and Joe. Enjoy your evening.